They're all gonna fall. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hello Bibliophiles, my name is Jill and this is the video that I can't wait to make all year. I didn't actually make this video last year uh, due to- I have a hair in my glasses- um, due to computer problems, phone problems, etc, uh, etc. Et I was also working a lot this time last year. So, uh, and because there's never any light I couldn't film. <laughs> so, I can film it this year. This is, as you know from clicking on the video, my favorite books of 2020 and conveniently I've been able to pick 20 books of 2020 um, which I didn't even try it just happened that way which is thrilling. The usual disclaimers I guess uh, these are not all books that were published in 2020 although a lot of them were um, but this these are books I read this year. I also haven't ranked these like all 20 of them I just have listed my top three kind of favorites of the year and then the rest of them are just whatever. They all are books I loved. The other thing is I have had such a good reading year. I was going through my list and I was like I can't- I couldn't even make a worst of list if I wanted to because I probably only have like three books I really didn't enjoy that would belong on that list. The rest of them are probably just books that- like they were fine, like I liked them well enough, I just didn't love them. But I actually had a bit of a hard time picking my absolute favorites because I have read- how many books I've read this year? I think I've read like 90 one, ninety-two, something like that, and like most of them are a four-star read. Three, like three and a half, four-star, four and a half, five-star. Like I haven't had anything, like very, very few two stars and under, which is amazing. Like what, what a I keep saying I've had such a good reading year, but it's true. But amidst all the all the the good reading of the year, I do have some that have stayed in my memory as being um, either an amazing reading experience at the time of reading them or books that I have not stopped thinking about or books I think are just really really perfectly done or like a like they deliver what you want them to deliver. So let's just get started, there's no reason to be around the bush. As I said, I will tell you my three favorite books of the year. Also just so you know, I'm filming on the shortest day of the year, December 21st, and so I am really fighting to get some <laughs> some natural light to be able to film this, so let's hope it stays while I'm filming this. Um, so yes, if you've seen other videos, you'll know for sure that my favorite book of the year is Cast by Isabella Wilkerson. I did do a review of this, which I will link uh, down below, but I've talked about it in other videos as well. This is um, the, sub the subtitle is the origin of our di origins of our discontents. This has been all over bestseller lists or like best books of the year lists, um, and for good reason. What Isabel Wilkerson does in this book, it's um, I listened to an interview with her on the New York Review of Books podcast and she talks about how when she was writing The Warmth of Other Suns, which I also read this year and really really enjoyed, um, but not as much as this one because she said while she was writing that book all she kept thinking about coming back to was the idea of caste and um, what she talks about in this book is um, reframing the way that people are treated or the way our society is structured um, as not necessarily a, a, as through racism, through the eyes of racism, but through a system of caste. And she looks at the Indian caste system and kind of explains what that system is, uh, as well as looks at Nazi Germany and um, how they structured their society and draws comparisons to how our society, uh, our, how our North American society, she's speaking about America here, but I think it's actually easily extrapolated to um, many other countries. Um, how it works now uh, based on those like similarities between those systems. The reason I think this book is so successful, aside from the fact that it fundamentally shifted how I understand uh, like this society <laughs> like and the language I use to talk about society, um, I think it also- the way it's formatted is really really smart because she looks- she does like all the kind of heavy hitting research and she kind of lays out um, the analysis and everything but she also then kind of pads that with stories of uh, real life people who've experienced these acts, um, these racist acts, but then she couches them and saying, well, let's look at this as uh, a caste system and kind of explains how it would work in that framing. And then she also talks about her own experiences. And I think that kind of having those three levels to talk about these ideas is super successful. I listened to this on audiobook first and I then I bought the hard copy, which I will definitely reread next year as my plan. Um, but I I loved the audiobook, I couldn't stop listening to it, which is not super- it's super rare for me actually to have that experience with an audiobook, so cannot recommend this book more. My favorite of the year, if you haven't picked it up and you're interested- and I actually think it's really approachable, like if you're not someone who reads a lot of nonfiction, her writing style is very easy to read. So 
would highly recommend this and especially the audiobook if you are so inclined to go that way but yeah loved this book my next two favorite books i've also talked about a lot so um not surprising to any of you i'm sure if you've seen my videos the first is transcendent kingdom by yad jassy this is her second book um her first book homegoing is incredible i also loved that but this book is about gifty who is a scientist looking at how she's her, she's doing her phd her thesis is about the way that um, our brain receptors work to receive um, like in terms of addiction and uh, why even despite negative results of a going for um, the, the, the addictive substance, why we keep going back even if there is a negative response to that. So there's that's like that's her research and she's doing that because her brother has died of an overdose um, uh, an opioid he had an opioid addiction and then uh it's also looking at her mother and her mother's depression and their relationship throughout her life um also her relationship with her father and who's not in the picture and we learn out we learn why in this book but it's also about her relationship to her religion and her mother is quite a religious person and um she grew up in a in gifty spent some time in ghana where her mother is from uh when she was a child and they, she had a very religious experience there as well. And I thought that the discussion between science and religion and um, these two belief systems interacting, conflicting, or maybe existing alongside each other in addition to like trying to process all that trauma in her life, I thought it was just the most sensitive, beautiful, thoughtful, quiet, reflective piece of writing, just stunning writing. It reads like a memoir. It's so beautiful to read. I absolutely loved this book. If you haven't picked it up, highly recommend. It's also quite short. It's only 200 and something pages, so it's not going to take you forever to read, but I absolutely loved this book. One of my favorites of the year and will be one of my favorites of all time. And last, of course, which I've talked about a bunch, is Hilary Mantel's The Mirror and the Light, the third book in the Thomas Cromwell trilogy. It's hard to really talk about like what this book is if you don't know the trilogy, but everyone knows the Wolf Hall uh, trilogy, uh, Thomas Cromwell. This is just a masterpiece. As I said before, it is perfection uh, in historical... I was going to say, like, it's not fiction, but it is obviously fiction. But Hilary Mantel has crafted these characters from so much research, so much... Um, she spent so much time in their heads that you almost feel like this is this is the truth. Like, this is the real version of their lives. That's how it feels when you read it. Like, I, I would believe everything about these people in real life if I was like going back in time and met like Thomas Cromwell I'd be like yes this is exactly who he is or who I expect him to be. I think the way that this kind of uh, wraps up his life um, because he does die at the end of this book as he died in history and um, I think the the way that we understand these two um, aging men so we have Thomas Cromwell and then King Henry VIII these two men who were they spend so much of their lives together, they've gone through so much together, they change a lot of society together, but they're both just sick of it. <laughs> they're sick of each other, they're old, they're unwell, um, they will never, especially King Henry VIII, we see him still being in his childlike ways, because he is a child in a lot of ways, but also kind of the adult in him resisting that, but not knowing how to be different. And we see Thomas Cromwell just getting really, really tired of having to cater to this man-child. And it's, I just, I love those kind of dynamics. Also, it's hilarious. The characters are so well developed. I just loved this book so much. This is the best finale to a series that I've ever read. And um, I don't know, I this is worth every minute you spend with it. It's amazing. Now for the rest of the books. So I was going through my list and I kind of put the rest of the books in two themes because I did have, um, I didn't really realize until toward the end of this year that I was having a very themed reading year. <laughs> um, the two kind of big <laughs> themes I'd put my reading in is I read a lot of books about the Soviet Union and about Russia and I read a lot of books in translation from Asia, specifically Japan. I read some other books from other countries but specifically Japan. So I have a lot of those and so let's talk about those. The two uh, from Russia slash Soviet Union that I want to, I read a lot of them a lot of them were really, really excellent. Um, Gulag by Anne Applebaum is a great book. Midnight in Chernobyl by Adam Higginbotham, another great book. Um, I read so many good books about that, but my two favorites are Disappearing Earth by Julia Phillips. This is a fiction book about two girls who go, two young girls who go missing. It's set on a Siberian peninsula called Kamchatka, I think, and these two young girls go missing, and it's set um, kind of post 
like immediately post-Soviet years, I believe, maybe the early 2000s. So, you know, a decade after the end of the Soviet Union. And um, we follow each chapter after that is people who live in the small town or, or near the small town who in some way relate to this, the, the missing girl story. And I've heard, I have to say this because I feel like a lot of the criticisms I've seen in this book have been that it's not a novel, it's a short story collection. And I don't know why I said it like that. I can see why people would say that, but I actually disagree entirely. I think this is a novel because there is a, a running thread throughout this book that does have a conclusion. There is a conclusion to this book that, that returns to the first part of this book. So there is something tying it together. And it does feel like we are getting a novel about a specific area. It doesn't feel to me like short stories. They do feel connected. Um, and I also don't think that's a criticism. Even, <laughs> like, even if it was short stories, which I don't feel like it reads that way to me, um, I still think it's incredible. Like, I think the writing is beautiful. I love all the characters in here. I was rooting for a lot of the characters in here who are clearly still suffering from just injustices that are beyond their control and I really loved it. I, I think the writing is beautiful and I will, um, I learned about um, the Evenki, which I, I think is how you pronounce it, which are um, indigenous people to this area uh, in, in Siberia, which I had never read anything about before and that was fascinating. Yeah, loved this book. Abs I mean, my first five star read of the year, gonna be one of my favorites for sure, and I loved it. My other kind of Soviet themed book that I am picking for a favorite is The Spy and the Traitor by Ben McIntyre. This is the story of, I can't I can't remember the man's name because I've loaned the book uh, to Jen <laughs> uh, to, fit, to read because I'm sure she will also love it. Um, but it is about a man who was very high up in the KGB toward the end of the Soviet Union. It shows how he, in his lifetime, uh, grew up in a party family and then he decided that it wasn't really working so he wanted to help take down the Soviet Union and slowly throughout his career working for the KGB he ended up getting a position where he was in London and he um, ended up working for MI6 to help take down the Soviet Union and the end of the book we have um, this like a, a great escape plan that can uh, that you couldn't even write in a movie. It's so thrilling. If you're into spy stuff and and kind of mystery thriller stuff, this is a book you have to read because it's a real life thriller. The last hundred pages were like a, <laughs> it was like watching a movie but better because movies are not this believable. <laughs> and like it was so good. Like the way that they have to um, try to try to all these little tiny pieces to de to develop his escape is incredible. It's so well written. Um, the story is incredible because it's true and it's such an amazing read. So I have never read anything by Ben McIntyre before and I'm definitely gonna read up read more from him. I was just on the edge of my seat when I was reading this book and I think that if this is the kind of, if you're interested in the Soviet Union, if you like mystery thrillers, if you like kind of spy movies and novels, you gotta read this one because it is so, so good. The next group of books is my books that are kind of a Japanese centric. Did you have one book that's, um, which I will get out now, that it's actually Korean in translation? Um, but I, I really liked my uh, books in translation this year and most of them were translated from um, different Asian languages. But the one that's Korean is The Plotters by Unsu Kim, uh, translated by Sora Kim Russell, I think. Let me just make sure that's true. Yeah, Sora Kim Russell. This is a story about, gosh, how do I even describe this? It's about the idea of an underground um, system of assassins and then there's a guy who works for the assassins and he's trying to, he's worked, uh, his name's Raccoon, I think, or something. Ren Seng is his name, but Raccoon is his kind of handler who like works just below the assassins and he gets the instructions. But then we find out there's people who are the plotters who work above the assassins who are like deciding who, like what happens to who when. And this is um, the main character, Ren Seng, trying to figure, like he accidentally falls into this quest to figure out who was behind all of this. And it's very funny, which I actually don't often find books in translation funny, and I think it's because it's very, very hard to translate humor. Like, that's probably the most complicated thing to translate. Um, but <laughs> he, this made me laugh. This also is so surprising at every turn. Everything that happened, I was like, I did not see that coming. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this. It's a little bit like spooky, creepy, scary in some ways. There's some things like there's a guy who runs a, uh, a crematorium who is involved in a lot of this. 
Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed this. It was such a surprise. I picked this up like in the first week of the pandemic and um, it just had a wonderful time reading it. It really kind of took me out of what I was experiencing, which was extreme fear <laughs> at the beginning of the pandemic. We first, the first lockdown in March and I absolutely loved this. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I really, I think this is a series and so I don't think the rest of it is translated in English. I think this was just translated like last year or this year into English. Let me just check. Yeah, it was only translated in 2018, 2019. So if there are more, if this is a series, if I, if I'm under correct in understanding that, I really hope that the rest of them are translated because, um, I would love to continue on in learning more about, like reading more about these people because it was just so delightful. Then I have three books translated from Japanese. The first is The ASL Murders by Riku Anda. I read this for Women in Translation Month and I... I just loved it. This is translated from Japanese by Alison Watts. And this is the story of a, like a, I don't know if it's 20 or 30 year old murder that uh, was never solved. The reason this book is so interesting is because we actually don't know who was asking the question. So like, we know that there's a book that's been written about this and this and this woman who wrote the book is interviewed in the very first chapter, but we don't know who's interviewing. And throughout the book, we get conversations, well, one-sided conversations, with other people who were involved. So delivery people who were around or um, people who knew the family, uh, people who might have a memory of what happened to that day. And I just have never read uh, a mystery like this and I thought it was so effective and it, it was like the perfect level of um, keeping you at arm's length where that I didn't feel like I, di like I wasn't being told stuff, but I also felt like I, I cannot figure this out <laughs> and I really enjoyed that and I enjoyed the kind of I think structuring it this way to kind of keep to interview lots of different people and never really know who's asking the questions is actually really effective in keeping you questioning and keeping you interested I think it's really smart and I loved the ending I thought it was so so I, I, I've seen some people say that it was like unresolved and I can kind of see that, but I actually thought that it was super effective and I I really thought it was super smart, really kind of sinister. Like I really liked the ending. I had no, I have no idea about this author, what else they have written, but would be very happy to read more. Another favorite is Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi, translated from the Japanese by Jeffrey Trusolo. This is the story of a little cafe that's kind of like, it's kind of like a magical cafe, it's kind of secret, it's kind of out of the way, and this cafe allows you to go back in time and talk to somebody from the past. But there's a bunch of rules about how you can do that, like you have to be sitting in a certain chair, you have to have a certain cup of coffee, and yeah, so the rules are actually very easy to understand, but they're also really specific, so I really like that element of this story. And so we, what we get in this book is a little bit about the kind of comings and goings of the people in the cafe who work there, but mostly it's focused on the four stories of people who go back in time and talk to someone. And I found this, it's quite short, but I was completely taken with the story, quite emotional. I really liked the way that it didn't, um, it didn't pander to its reader, like it didn't give you what you wanted necessarily, or what, like, you know, what's expected of like this perfect ending, but I found it just so touching, really intelligent. I liked the magic magical stuff that was going on in here. I thought it was great. So there's a second book which I have on my shelf which I'm going to read over the holidays is my is my um, plan. But I really really enjoyed this and I think lots of other people would really like it too. And probably my favorite of like the translated books that I've read this year is Strange Weather in Tokyo by Hir Hiromi Kawakami. I was originally like skeptical to pick up because even though it super appealed to me when people talk about it but I've heard other people say it wasn't like the best. And I read this probably like a month ago and I loved it. I loved it. This is basically a love story between um, people who knew each other in the past. So it's a, a girl who was a student and her teacher, but it's obviously like 20 years after high school. So they haven't seen each other for such a long time and they're both a lot older. And it's about the two of them having um, quite solitary lives and both of them being very okay with that and them slowly developing this friendship and then trying to understand, trying to slowly make sense of what they are to each other, both to themselves but to each other. And I just thought it was a really believable, realistic way that people enter each other's lives. One thing I don't like about love stories or romances is that I, I really hate miscommunication that feels really dumb. Like if they just 
talked about this really obvious thing this wouldn't be a problem and here there is miscommunication but it's definitely not dumb <laughs> like they are very clear and direct with each other when they're speaking but they both think differently so they communicate um differently with each other sometimes or they can't but they themselves don't even really know what they want and so they can't communicate it properly to the other person and that is interesting and and realistic and believable and i just loved this i thought it was um beautifully written i loved the descriptions of the actual setting in 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 and around tokyo and uh i loved it i absolutely loved it my last japanese related book is pure invention by matt alt the subtitle is how japan's pop culture conquered the world i also cannot say pop culture without sounding like a newfoundlander pop culture pop culture anyway <laughs> this is about exactly what it says um it's focusing largely on uh some things kind of late 1800s early 1900s but mostly post-world war ii how um japan rebuilding itself after a, like devastation after world war ii uh to being a cultural um mecca for a lot of the western world it focuses on specific uh types of technology so we talk about the walkman in here we talk about um anime of course and manga and uh tamagotchis and of course nintendo and video games i thought this book was so interesting because it's not just about it does talk about the technologies and how they were made which is super interesting but it also talks about um the people behind it and it focuses a lot on like some of the women who were um behind a lot of these creations who didn't get uh who don't get the right recognition because of still sexism that existed at the time and still kind of does in japan especially looking at hello kitty and like that story which i thought was probably one of my favorite parts of the book was the hello kitty uh, and the kawaii culture uh this is an amazing book if you grew up in the 80s 90s japanese culture was a part of your every day so this is super interesting uh i really really loved it and i would like to know like this was a great start for looking at japanese history and culture um to kind of give like lay the groundwork of like recent history and then to go further back so i really really loved this book the next category that i had decided to talk about was canadian books that i loved i have three that were my favorites of the year the first is all my puny sorrows by miriam taves this is a story of two sisters who are who grew up in a mennonite community and uh one is a t very talented musician she is beautiful she is accomplished she has this really wonderful husband and then uh her other sister who is kind of less of all of those things she kind of is a little bit of a mess she has you know a broken marriage uh she's kind of never really settled in her job the thing is the sister who is very accomplished is suicidal and she has tried multiple times to die by suicide and she has failed um multiple times throughout her life and we open this book with the sister being in the hospital after another attempt and so the other the younger sister and her mother and then the the sister's uh husband are all there cycling in and out of the hospital also talking to each other about what they're going to do about to help this sister i can't remember her name what is her name elfrida is the one who is in the hospital and uh they're all talking about um what they're going to do about this and it really is i mean it could be a lot darker than it actually is but it really is a story about two sisters who truly love each other and they don't want to hurt each other and elfrida is just she just doesn't want to be alive like that is the only thing she can explain and even though she has all these things going for her she just the weight of being alive is too much for her and so we have this relationship between these sisters trying to support and love each other but they both like what they want is a fundamental disagreement with each other because one wants to die and one wants the other one to live this is funny it is heartwarming it is heart-wrenching it is sad it is beautiful it is is written by somebody who knows what they're talking about so miriam taves herself her father and her sister both died by suicide in her own life and so you can tell that there is a sensitivity there's an intelligence there about that and you do feel a bit like this is the things that she wanted to say herself um and that's obviously me imposing on her but it does feel that way it feels honest it feels um like someone who knows what they're talking about and this is an incredible book it's beautiful i mean like, this whole thing is highlighted to death because like there's so much beautiful writing in here um yeah stunning beautiful profound 
and not as sad as you think it would be. Also for nonfiction member, I read Chop Suey Nation by Anne Hui. This is a nonfiction book about Anne and her partner who drive across the country of Canada from the west coast, like all the way to the west coast, to all the way uh, to Newfoundland, to the very tip of, of the east coast. Ooh understand why these small Chinese restaurants have cropped up all over the country uh, in kind of the most remote of places where there's not huge population and yet they are all quite similar, they all have quite similar stories of origin and she wants to kind of piece together why that is. So the book is partially about that it, and like about the food and about the about the people who run the restaurants and about the restaurants themselves but the other part of the book is about her father and her father who owned a restaurant uh, or worked at a restaurant uh, who he did own restaurants two restaurants in Abbotsford BC as well as he worked in restaurants in Vancouver for uh, most of his working life but it's about his her father and then her grandfather's uh, experiences immigrating to Canada and so we look at um, just the, the book kind of alternates between the two like talking about restaurants and places in Canada and then going to stories about set in China um, and parts of Canada about when her father and his family immigrated over and I loved this book so much and it was a book that I read at the time as I was reading I was like I'm really enjoying this book but as I've sat with it a little bit it has stuck with me as being this super intelligently structured story where we have we have the story of a nation uh, a nation of immigrants told through the through a restaurant but then we also have the story of one we zero in on one family and their story of immigrating and it is uh incredible like things i didn't things i would never have known through the history books things i have uh like just about the rules and regulations about immigrating but also about where people come from and how they ended up coming to Canada from this particular region of, of China. Super interesting, really really loved it, highly recommend it. I, I just found it, it's a delightful, delightful read. It's like a love letter to her father, a love letter to her culture. Just a really really beautiful book and I would I could not recommend it more highly. I think many many people will really enjoy this book. And the last Canadian book I'm going to talk about is A Mind Spread Out on the Ground by Alicia Elliott. This is a collection of essays. She's a Hod Hodnasani. I think it's how you pronounce it, um, from the Six Nations. And she talks a lot about her experiences growing up as a, her, mo her mother is white, her father uh, is an indigenous, uh, I think he's Mohawk. It's a complicated childhood where uh, the parents are not always there for the kids and uh, often are, have hurt the children quite a lot in ways that's difficult to really process. And so she'd look, her essays look at that in different ways, framing it different ways. My favorite essay in the book was about um, generational trauma through food and how that affects physically and how that manifests in bodies physically um, through poor eating habits uh, that has been, have been passed down through generations. I thought that was the most interesting, profound thing I've ever read. I thought about that essay for months. I read this book in January and I have not stopped thinking about it. This book made me think a lot about my responsibility as uh, fr coming from a settler people in this country uh, and to my responsibility to uh, indigenous people to help reparations where they're due. I, I, don't, I don't even know the language really to talk about this appropriately except that I know that um, there is so much work to be done in this country to really uh, truly truly reconcile and I don't know if th I don't even know if that's really possible in the way that we do things at the moment but I just know that um there is a lot of hurt and things I hadn't I just things I hadn't learned um about what it's like to be indigenous in this country from any other way and it was really really uh it really it really like carved out my heart you know and um yeah I think this was a really big eye-opener for me and it really shifted kind of how I read books all year. So could not recommend it more highly. I just, it stuck with me so strongly. And yeah, an incredible, incredible book uh, worth reading. No matter where you're from in the world, it's worth reading. Uh, it is just, also she's a beautiful writer. I just loved her writing so much. And the way she talks about depression is something I've never read before and I felt very, I could very strongly relate to it. So I also loved the first essay which is about depression um, called and how the the word translated from Mohawk for depression means a mind spread out on the ground and that uh, has stuck with me very profoundly. Anyway, point is love it. Great, great book. Highly recommend it. I also read some classics, some classics this year, I guess we call them classics, that I of course loved. The first was Jane Eyre. I am shocked how much I loved Jane Eyre. I think 
I was so surprised because even though everybody talks about Jane Eyre, they never really, like, I didn't really know what it was about. Like, <laughs> I mean, I knew there was kind of a love story with, like, a dark brooding man and then there was a woman, there was fire and there's a woman in the attic. But I didn't understand how all these things connected. And I, this is, this is a propelling story. I mean, I don't think it's perfect, of course, but I read this very quickly in a couple of days and I, I did like a reading vlog or like a, not a vlog, I just like updated on my, on my Instagram when I was reading it. And I was just like so delighted and shocked and enjoyed this reading experience so much. I could not believe how much I enjoyed this book. So yes, um, if you are someone who has not read Jane Eyre, you've been holding out because you think you wouldn't like it, I was the same and I was wrong. So maybe, maybe you should read Jane Eyre. I also finally read um, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie. This is number two in the Herc no, number four in the Hercule Poirot series. And um, I had heard someone say that this was like a book that was the first book like it in this particular type of uh, story, like twist or storytelling of uh, this genre. And I had to read it, of course, and I gasped. I did not see the ending coming. And like, I never do with Christy. Like she's, I also don't really care. Like I'm not somebody who has to know the endings of like, have, I don't love to guess them. Like, that's not my favorite thing to do, but I couldn't, I had no idea where this was going. And I was genuinely shocked by the twist in this book. I loved this book. Um, and it was one of these things where I was reading it and I, I, I really didn't want to stop. Like I had to go to work and I was like, how dare I have to go to work when I really just want to finish reading this book. So yeah, I was absolutely thrilled. This is my favorite Christie, I think. Um, yeah. And I've read like her other big ones. I've read, um, and then there were none and, uh, the murder on the Orient Express. This is my favorite of those three. Just four books left for the books I my favorites of the year. The first is City of Girls by Elizabeth Gilbert. I listened to this on audiobook based on the recommendation of my friends Thea and Stacy, who both listened to an audiobook and both loved it. And I was not 100% sure that I would really be sold on this because I, I didn't even really know what it was about. Um, and, I, and I've heard people review it and kind of not really say what it's about because it's not really about anything. Um, it is about a young girl who uh, goes to New York and it's about an, an older woman reflecting on her youth in New York City and um, some of the mistakes she made, some of the things that she regretted or doesn't regret, um, but the things that kind of went on in her life. Uh, and I, the writing is amazing. It's super funny. It's set in um, a theater. So we have lots of really flamboyant, um, larger than life people, characters in this story who are just exceptional to read about. Uh, I loved the way that the story was told, like having an older person narrate it and kind of say like, I don't regret it. I don't regret it. And kind of saying, I know this sounds silly, uh, but at the time this is what I was thinking. And I thought that was just excellent. Such a smart narrative choice. Really, really um, descriptive, colorful, uh, really, really a sense of, a strong sense of place. I just absolutely loved it. It was, it's a long audiobook. I listened to the whole thing and was such a delight. I don't really like, again, I'm not a huge audiobook listener, but I absolutely loved it. Um, and I am late to the City of Girls train, but it is such a good book. And uh, I think it's a book that I would like return to if I was ever like, I just want to feel good. I'm gonna listen to the City of Girls book because it's just, it's so wonderful. My last nonfiction book is Answers in the Form of Questions, A Definitive History and Insider's Guide to Jeopardy by Claire McNear. This is, of course, a history of Jeopardy, a history and, and a kind of behind the scenes of how Jeopardy works. And I was reading this kind of kind of kismetly uh, the day that um, Alex Trebek died. And it felt like a wonderful tribute to be reading this book, which is quite lovingly written and quite reverent, um, but also being quite funny and clever and um, not like not not sugarcoating or anything or like not there's anything sugarcoat for <laughs> Jeopardy but it is a wonderful book it is the perfect tone the perfect pacing the perfect format I didn't know what I expected from this book but it is exactly what I wanted like it, it all works perfectly I am so delighted by this book and I think if you were a fan of game shows like it really kind of pulls back the curtain about why Jeopardy was structured the way it was why and how the questions ended up being written the way they were 
how to play the game, like the, how important the buzzer is in the game, um, and like the kind of world behind the TV show, like the this way see your TV, but like the people who prepare and the tournaments that exist outside of the Jeopardy world to like prepare for Jeopardy the show. Yeah, this is, it's such a good book. And um, it was just such a delightful read to read, uh, you know, kind of in memoriam of the wonderful work that Alex Trebek has done throughout his career, especially on a show that, you know, every day you would spend, a, you know, half an hour with Alex Trebek. And um, this was a wonderful way to kind of honor him, remember him, and also just learn a lot about a great show. So I could not recommend this book more highly. You thought I was going to forget, didn't you? I did not. Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. It's so funny, I was thinking about this because everyone's talking about how they want to read more Maggie O'Farrell after reading this book, and I don't <laughs> because I read her kind of memoir, I Am, I Am, I Am, last year, and I found her writing style really uh, too much, over the top, uh, you know, really in my face. And the same writing style it exists in the Hamnet, but it 100% works with the storyline because it's set in the 1500s and it's um, very much has a Shakespearean lilt to the story. This is, of course, a book about Shakespeare's family, mostly, not really necessarily Shakespeare. Um, I've seen some criticisms of this, especially from Chris Bocas Cauldron, um, and I'm gonna link his video below because <laughs> I think it's fair. I think his criticisms are fair, um, but I, I also loved this book. I loved the, I guess in the same way that I loved The Mirror in the Light, I love that that, like, it feels like that could really have happened. This is how this feels. It feels true enough, genuine enough, but also um, emotional enough to be a real thing that happened. And I loved that. I also love stories about twins, as we know if you've watched my channel at all. I love twin stories. This is a story about um, Hamnet and Judith, uh, twins, um, Shakespeare's twin children. And Hamnet, of course, uh, dies he died, we know that Hamlet died uh, when he was 10 or 11. And the other thing is, <laughs> this is also kind of set about a plague. So I read this before, like, I think I read this in February. So before the um, the pandemic really hit. And so like, kind of reflecting on that, I was like, ooh, this is a really interesting way to um, highlight <laughs> what happens during a plague. Uh, but yeah, so I, I don't know if, if that would change someone's opinion about it. But anyway, the point is, I think the ending of this book is one of the best endings I've ever read. It was so emotional. I think the way that that, um, the way that she kind of highlights connection without being so blatant about it, it's really, really skillfully written and it's very beautiful. And I love this book. And my last favorite of the year is Good Talk by Mira Jacob. Um, this is a memoir in conversation. This is a graphic novel. And I don't read a lot of graphic novels. It's the only one I've read all year. And I loved this book. Obviously, it's on my favorite list. <laughs> this is so good. I think why this is a favorite of mine. So what the story is, uh, in case you don't know, and I think lots of people talk about this, so I, I feel like it's been around. But the story is that Mira Jacob is talking to her son, who uh, she herself is Indian. She's Indian, uh, first generation Indian American. And her husband is um, Jewish. And their son, of course, is mixed race. And he is asking her questions as a, as a six-year-old about being a person of color in the United States. So this is set around uh, the 2016 election. So we have a lot of discussions about racism and uh, stuff coming up in the news of the time. At first I was kind of like, I, I was enjoying it. Like I, the story, it's about her reflecting on her experience growing up as a person of color and then kind of how, she, thinking about her own past, how she will explain this to her child. Um, but then it gets into, toward the end of this book, into some serious questions about, and, and conversations about the role of allyship. Like, what does it mean to be a white ally? And I thought that some of the stuff she says in here, I had never thought of before. I had never thought about it that way. And it really, like, punched me in the gut. I was like, this is incredibly written and, like, well, well articulated and in a way that it makes total sense, like, mentally and emotionally. I just thought it was profound in those ways. So yes, definitely a favorite. That's it. That's all. Those are my favorite books of the year. This has been, again, as I said, an insane year, but a great reading year. And I am very, very glad, as always, that books have been my company, um, my comfort, my friends, my like, I feel like my comfort activity is just, like, if I'm kind of 
if I don't, if I don't know what to do, if I'm lost, if I'm feeling really fidgety, which is happens all the time, uh, I just pick up a book and I just sit down and other than I can focus for a long period of time, uh, it doesn't matter. I feel like I have my books to like comfort me. Yeah. Is that lame? I don't care. Thank you so much for being with me on this journey this year. It has been um, an up and down ride. Not booktube, as I've had a great time on booktube, but generally the year has been up and down. And I am just so glad you're here with me and I'm so glad to be able to share this with you. It makes it a lot more fun, honestly, for me to be able to film and chat about it. And uh, you're all so lovely and wonderful. And I just wish you all a, a really relaxing holiday, a break from the chaos. And um, I really hope you're rested and relaxed going into the new year. And I do feel very hopeful about the new year at this stage um, in a way I didn't feel all year. So I'm feeling a lot better about that. Um, so yes, happy new year to you all. Um, enjoy some great books, some good, some good hot beverages. And uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.